Well, now we're, we're going to, to return to, you know, our discussion of cognitive behavior therapy. And, and as you can see, you know, there, there's really a very significant shift when we get to cognitive behavior therapy. And, and if you recall, what I was mentioning uh, when we introduced this is that it started out as just behavior therapy. And, and it really, you know, grew out, especially out of the work of Skinner, but out of the work even of psychologists wanting to be able to do research on behavior change. And it certainly seemed easier if you could do your research on things that are observable. Uh, and that the thing that became problematic, of course, was that this internal life of people was so difficult to measure. Now, one of the reasons for why behavior therapy in its strictest sense didn't uh, you know, become very uh, inclusive was that so many disorders uh, are really based on internal life. Uh, for instance, you know, like mood disorders. Uh, the, the idea that someone is depressed, I mean, if you're not going to deal with their internal life, it's gonna be pretty hard to, to understand that. Or if somebody has uh, a cognitive disorder, say like they have obsessions, you can't see the obsessions. So it didn't take long for people to realize that uh, we, we had to have a, a more complicated uh, way to approach these things. And you had to allow for people to have an internal life. And cognitive behavior therapy uh, started as a way to allow for that. And then you, uh, you know, may recall we decided, well, we'll focus on one problem. We'll, we'll focus on depression. And we started talking about Aaron Beck's uh, theory of depression. And, and if you look, you'll see that the, the cognitive triad that we mentioned before, that we were saying, you know, depressed people, uh, you know, have negative views of themselves. I mean, their, their way of looking at uh, themselves is, is to see only negative things usually. But they, they carry that not only about, you know, how they feel about themselves, but they also feel negatively about their experiences. That they feel that what's, what's happening to them or what they're doing, uh, you know, isn't really rewarding, isn't what they would like to do. And then the third part is that they also think that this is gonna be continuing. They feel this is a, a chronic, uh, you know, state for them. That is that their future is bleak. Now that's important as you can imagine because if you were going through a depressive episode but for some reason you thought, you know, this will end soon, uh, then you know you really wouldn't be that upset. So it's, it's really, you know, that sense, internal sense that this is the way I am. This is the way life is going to be. That's what makes depression so difficult for people. Now, when we, uh, you know, we look at this, uh, you're going to see that, and today we're going to go through both the treatment of depression and some of the studies that have been done on it to, to try to examine, you know, just what have we learned. But uh, the, one of the differences uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy, in fact, in, in whenever uh, people you know, use this uh, intervention, is that they actually are trying to intervene on something very specific. And that's quite different, uh, and it's from the beginning, as you'll see as we, we go through this. That's quite different than uh, psychoanalytic and psychodynamic therapies that kind of presume whatever it is you present is probably not the problem. That we're gonna have to discover the problem, that is, you the client and I the therapist will have to work at this until we, we discover what are the more complicated underlying issues uh, that have led you to feel the way you feel? Now, much of that is also true in client-centered therapy. Uh, the things that change a bit, as you know, is the client-centered therapy comes from a personality theory that is far more optimistic about people. And, and there's a lot of emphasis that if you can help somebody to develop interpersonally, that is to be able to be free enough to talk about their problems and to be free enough to, uh, to explore problems without being overwhelmed by them, that they will discover alternate ways to behave. Now, in cognitive behavioral therapy, you're gonna see, we're gonna be much more active. That is, that there's, first of all, there's gonna be a target uh, or a couple of targets 
uh, behavior that someone is going to want to work on, and the focus in the treatment is going to be very specifically on those targets. Now, you may recall right at the end I was mentioning in our last session that the first step in treatment, in cognitive behavioral treatment, is to, is to really help clients become more aware of their thoughts. And, to, uh, and the way you do this is through kind of self-monitoring mechanisms. That is, you get a client to start doing a lot of reflecting about, uh, you know, and, and consciously making aware to themselves, what is it you think about? Uh, and what is the content of those thoughts? And of course, uh, you know, in someone who's very negative about themselves, you begin to you know, realize the content is always negative, that people think badly of themselves. And that's where we get the triad that we just talked about, that everything turns out to be negative. Now, in the beginning, the, the experience for the client in any therapy, and that includes cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, is very difficult. Because, and, and in cognitive behavioral therapy, the person is trying to learn how to question the premises that they have for their life. Uh, the idea being, you know, if, if you can change someone's way of thinking about certain problems, uh, you can free them up. And if they change their way of thinking, they will change their way of behaving. And that then leads emotionally to people feeling better about themselves. Now, to, to assist in getting the, <coughs> the person there, in behavioral therapy, there are things we call exercises. Actually, the client is encouraged in some ways to actually become a scientist uh, uh, discovering or trying to discover their own life. That is, what we say to them is, think about whatever the problem is the person presents as an hypothesis. And then <clears throat> let's explore, is this really true? That is, are you the way you think you are? Or are you in a situation that uh, is as bad as, uh, as you present it? Let's take the example that a person is having terrible difficulties at work. They just can't get along with their boss. They're, they're, and they have a lot of interaction with their boss. Now, some people, uh, and let's I even go so far as to say the boss is kind of chronically an unlikable person. You know, this is somebody you really don't want to be around. Well, either the person can decide to leave a job, except maybe they don't have that choice, maybe they need to stay on this job, or they can begin to assess, is it as bad working for this person as I keep telling myself? Or are there changes I can make in my behavior? Maybe I can't change anything in this person I work for, but maybe I can make some changes in my behavior, and maybe I can make some changes in the way I interact with this person that will lead to less conflict, ideally no conflict. Uh, but I have to start thinking of new ways because it's very clear, uh, given the person is in your office, that whatever that individual is doing now, it is not working. And of course, you know, in terms of evaluating that person, if we take the triad we talked about, the, the real dilemma is that the person thinks this is just going to continue. So you've, so you've got to get this kind of frame of mind of the scientist <clears throat> in your client so the client begins to really raise hypotheses about, does my life really have to be this way? Uh, and that becomes important because sometimes <clears throat> just the answers to questioning are in themselves very facilitating. <clears throat> For example, supposing someone comes in and says, <clears throat> I'm just having a terrible time with my, my lover or my spouse. Uh, you know, we, we've been having a lot of conflict lately. And, uh, and the person feels, and you know, it's just going to continue on. It's not going to get any better. Uh, and this is where it becomes very important, by the way, for the therapist to, to really listen carefully. Now, when we talked uh, a while back about countertransference, if the therapist, for example, was, was in a, a bad relationship and the therapist was going through a period being very discouraged, the therapist might start off 
agreeing with the client, saying, oh boy, I, you know, whether they say it or not, but they may be thinking, you know, I know just what it's like. You know, it's, relationships just aren't, aren't what they're said to be. Um, it sure is discouraging to try to love another person. They don't appreciate me. Uh, maybe they don't even want me. All kinds of negative things, you know, might, the therapist might be thinking and the client's thinking this. Now this is where, you know, it would be inappropriate <clears throat> for this therapist to not interrupt his or her own thinking because the client's problem may be very different. So we, we go back now to our client who's come in and presented, relationships aren't worth, this relationship is not working, I'm very discouraged. Rather than accept that the relationship is not working, which is a, is a clinical error, it's the job of the therapist to begin to learn more about what is going on in this relationship. Like, why is this person in my office? Why is this person having difficulty? And sometimes when you have the person, you know, give you more information, that is, you're open to a lot of possibilities as the therapist, you find the client saying things, well, you know, my lover just wants me to be around a lot more. I mean, my lover, you know, is constantly saying that, you know, he or she would like to do more things, that uh, that person wishes I would come home earlier. Uh, when you begin to question further, you find out this is somebody who's almost a workaholic, maybe is a workaholic. They're spending long hours at work. Uh, they come home exhausted. They only talk about work. Uh, and actually, the relationship that this person is concerned about uh, is not in as much trouble as one might think. That is, the other person really likes this person. That is, the, the spouse or the lover who supposedly is dissatisfied is not dissatisfied with this person so much as with the quality of the life that they're leading. Now, if you discover that, then you can start you know, talking very concretely with someone about, do you value this other person? Well, of course I value that person. Well, then maybe you're going to have to force yourself to spend more time. And that's where in behavior therapy you, be give, you, know, you begin to give people assignments uh, where you start to saying, you know, like you must leave work at a certain hour. Uh, you have to sit down with your, your uh, partner and do some planning and listen carefully to some of the things that your partner would like to do. And also you might give them an assignment, uh, communicate to your partner something you would like to do. But you know, if you're, if you're really open, you may find out actually the problem that the person presents with can be solved. Not only that, but uh, it may also take pressure off the person uh, at work. Uh, it may give them a more balanced life. I mean, there's a lot of things that you could accomplish uh, if you listen well and then you start giving the people uh, these exercises. Now, you might be saying, well, there's, there, are, there are other things that could happen, and that's true. There are other things that could happen. For example, if the couple spent a lot more time together, will they continue to, uh, to like each other so much? Well, we don't know. But certainly, the way it's going now is not working, uh, and there is enough evidence to suggest, yeah, you know, they can make a good adjustment, and their life together can be much better. Now, as you can see, an important part of uh, cognitive behavior therapy is exercises that, and they're aimed at, at changing the client's expectancies about their abilities to function in certain situations. The, you know, so commonly people have simply given up thinking that I can't change things. And the idea of giving them a, what's sometimes called homework is to get them to go out and to try new things. Now, I also want to you know, emphasize, <clears throat> we don't want to be simplistic about this. You, you, know, you have to be very sensitive to what is a reasonable risk level for someone. Uh, you can't just create uh, you know, a plan for your client to do things. That might be overwhelming. So you, you, know, you can't go and tell them, you know, give up your job and spend all your time with your, your spouse or your lover because there's a danger you're going to lose them. A uh, person probably couldn't do that, uh, but also it, it's so extreme it just overwhelms the person in the other way. You know, so you've got to start thinking about, you know, uh, supposing the person says, I always come home from work, you know, at 8 o'clock. Say, well, let's aim for 7. 
And let's aim for when you get home, the first thing you talk about is not work. That might be, you know, as much, and, and, but you, the therapist, may be saying that uh, the person can do this. Probably, I'm going to suggest you really want to aim to get home at 6. Uh, that gives you, you know, an evening with the person, or that, you know, you only go to work every other Saturday, or various other things. But whatever the exercise is, it has to be reasonable enough that the person can do it. Because what you do not want to do is to create uh, exercises for people that will be additional failures for them on top of the failure they're already experiencing. Now, the therapy sessions themselves can, can be very useful in, in helping the person to prepare for an exercise. Let's say that somebody uh, comes in and they're, they're, they're really having a poor interpersonal life. Dating is going nowhere. And they actually get you know, very anxious about asking for a date. Well, the therapist might help them to rehearse uh, how they're going to go about seeking a date. And, and the first thing you know, might be to have the person tell you, like, what, what do you do when you call someone and you want to ask them out? Just pretend you're calling me and, and tell me uh, you know, that you'd like to, to go out. Well, sometimes when you, you listen to the individual, you see that they, they communicate so much anxiety in their first contact with a person that it's not surprising the other person says no. Uh, the client actually may be quite a likable person, quite a talented person. But you can't know that from your first contact with them because what you experience in the first contact is so much anxiety. So you might teach the person a bit about how to relax first before uh, you know, you call someone, uh, how to, you know, ask some casual questions and how to, you know, talk to someone, uh, you know, in a very ordinary way, uh, to not get too worked up uh, about asking the person out, uh, perhaps to, you know, choose that the first time you meet with someone is to do it very casually, I mean, to meet for a drink or for coffee or something like that. Uh, but not to make the occasion so momentous that the other person may feel a pressure they don't want to feel, so they're going to say no. And, and so the, the homework assignment may really already have been acted out right in the therapy session itself. And then the person goes on from there. Now, another uh, behavioral uh, treatment that's used in sub disorders is called exposure and response prevention. And here, clients might be encouraged to resist the urge to engage in dysfunctional behaviors while exposing them to the stimuli that, that would typically elicit such behaviors. Now, uh, for instance, if you have somebody who is a binge eater, you might want to try to get the person to understand that it's okay to be exposed <clears throat> to food that has some fat in it. After all, it's pretty hard to avoid uh, all foods that have some fat in it. So what you do is you have them be exposed to food that has some fat, but you want them to be able to have only a modest amount of it. And, and so you, you try to get them to understand that there is not this extreme that you may think. That is, it's not as if uh, you're like a physiologically addicted alcoholic. You know, touch some food with a little fat, and then you must binge and binge and binge and just eat and eat and eat. Rather, you try to help the people to understand you can be exposed to this and you can have some of it, and you can stop. And, and so the idea is to try to help a person realize that you're not living in an all or none world. That the world in which you are living, there, there really are options. And, and of course, the, the obvious important lesson is you want someone to appreciate you actually can eat certain kinds of food and you can stop. In other words, you can have control. The 
issue, you know, in binge eating, of course, is the person always feels out of control. Once I have the, the first morsel of a hamburger, you know, I, I have to eat three of them. Uh, getting a person to understand that, you know, you might satisfy your hunger with half a hamburger, uh, and that's okay. Uh, that, that's a tremendous accomplishment for people who have been binge eaters, and, and it's been uh, shown, especially in, in this kind of uh, treatment, that you can help people to have kind of moderation in their lives and not be lost in this world of extremes, that either I must totally refrain or I'm going to be out of control. Now, another uh, important aspect uh, that flows from this uh, in, uh, in cognitive behavioral therapy is that you want to get clients to understand that a single lapse is not necessarily a failure. Uh, often, uh, you know, people who have these very rigid ideas, like, you know, it's, it's either all or it's none, they also feel if I ever give in to this, if, if once I, you know, binge, that I've, I've now become a bad person again, and I'm back to where I was before, that I've, I've lost all the gains I've made, and I'm just like I've always been. And what you really want to help the person understand is, no, you know, th this is very human. This happens to people. Uh, you do not have to think that you are back to where you were before. Uh, and in fact, uh, you want to get them to understand, even though you binge this time, you don't have to continue that behavior. And why this is important is we have, we have taught people in our culture in many ways, uh, you have to avoid all bad things all the time. And some people then incorporate you know, a value system, if I can't avoid a bad thing all the time, I may as well just give in to it. Probably, by the way, some of this, you know, comes from some religions where uh, one sin and you're going to hell. Uh, you know, when, if you, if you live that way, then any negative act, you know, becomes, you know, incredibly scary. Uh, and sometimes, you know, people begin to feel, I'm just not strong enough to fight this, so I'm just going to keep on doing it. This mode of intervention helps to get people to kind of recognize their humanity. Yeah, you may do these, some wrongs here or there. Uh, that doesn't make you an evil person. It doesn't make you a failure. And, and failure is, is very important. That, that the fact that you broke the rules once or you did uh, what you did once does not mean that you no longer are going to be able to be a good person. Now, there are uh, you know, some other things, some other features of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy that it clearly does distinguish it from other treatments. First, you know, a thorough evaluation is, is conducted initially. That's not different in the, in the sense that most uh, treatments do that. But what's somewhat different is that the, clara the therapist and the client agree to either a, a specific problem or some set of problems that will be addressed. And so there's, you know, kind of a contract that's being developed in the, this assessment phase that this is what we're going to work on, and it's pretty concrete. Uh, now, as you know, in, in, in the other treatments we've talked about, uh, it takes a while for the, the client and the therapist to arrive at any kind of understanding about what the, the real issues are. And there is a premise in other forms of therapy that often what the person presents is not the problem. In cognitive behavioral therapy, for the most part, a point, the premise is what the person says is the problem or what the person and the therapist can listen and agree to is the problem is what's going to be focused on. So once this is uh, agreed upon, then, the, then cognitive behavioral therapists sometimes, uh, to some extent, will rely on manuals that have been developed to work on specific psychological problems. So there's kind of like a very systematic way to go about working on this particular problem. Now, manuals are, are both good and bad. The, the good part of them is there's, there's a systematic way uh, to treat a problem. And there are certain anticipations on the part of the therapist about how you will go about 
leading the person along to overcome this difficulty. Uh, to be honest, I think that uh, manuals also have been favored by some psychologists because it makes research a lot easier. That is, you're going to systematically uh, treat each person <clears throat> in somewhat the same way, so it's easy to do your study, it's easy to see does this work or doesn't it work. And the reality is that uh, the client uh, in some cases, we'll find following this kind of protocol that the, the therapist is, is leading them through uh, very helpful. There are other cases where, uh, especially if the therapist is not quite talented, the manual takes over and, and the person gets lost. That is, the, the therapist is so kind of automatic, uh, is so programmed that the client doesn't really experience I'm with a person. And the, one of the, the real reasons for why uh, you know, these manuals are problematic is, you know, rarely is the problem of one person identical to the problem of, of another person. You know, the premise with a manual is that actually, you know, there are whole groups of people who have the same problem. Even if you take a problem, you know, as, as clearly defined as, as binge eating, uh, there can be a lot of reasons for why someone is a binge eater. And for some people, perhaps the manual approach will work, a very kind of uh, set uh, pattern of, of getting them to go and do certain things uh, will, will actually be very helpful. But for other people, it may miss the point. And, and still, we're, we're a long ways yet from developing, let's say, protocols that you know, really work for disorders. It's not that we shouldn't try, uh, at least for some disorders, because actually uh, it, it does inform us a great deal about what might be helpful. And we do know if we try the same kinds of interventions on groups of people, we kind of get a sense about, you know, do they work or don't they work? But, uh, but people are very complex. And once you give up uh, kind of appreciating the, the complexity of a person, then you have a very serious, serious problem. Uh, and and you, you, you really may lose the sensitivity you need to, to be effective as a therapist. Now another you know, interesting aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy is that it focuses on, on the here and now. Uh, as I've mentioned to you a couple of times already, there's really no emphasis on, on examining history. That is, you, you learn the history only to find out uh, how long the person's had the problem and perhaps how, how difficult the problem is. But you're not going to spend your time focusing on history. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to focus on how can this person change whatever it is he or she says they want to change. So we're in the here and now and we're going to work in the here and now and, and our goal is to change things in the here and now and in the immediate future. Now also, as I mentioned, yeah, in, in many forms of therapy, much of the work, especially early in therapy, takes place in the session itself. That is, the person reveals a lot of painful memories, a, a lot of hurt, a lot of difficulty, and a lot goes on in the session. In cognitive behavioral therapy, not only do things go on in the session, but you know, often clients are given homework so that there is a lot of activity that the client is to be working on all the time. And it's interesting, you know, that this wasn't uh, developed earlier because it obviously makes good sense to try to use all that time outside of therapy for the person to be able to try out certain behaviors that really may be very helpful to them. Now, there have been numerous uh, studies that have been done on, on cognitive behavioral therapy. As they say, you know, it's developed uh, by clinical psychologists. Uh, many of the people who fostered uh, this treatment uh, were people who had some kind of academic affiliation. And to be really honest, you probably find much more cognitive behavioral therapy being done in university clinics than you will in state hospitals or community mental health centers. Uh, although as people, you know, younger psychologists are graduating, this form of intervention is becoming, uh, see, it, it's being seen more often, like in community mental health centers 
as people go out and try it. Uh, also, I might just add parenthetically that uh, you know, some of our graduates who have worked only in university clinics, which is a very narrow way because you're seeing university students who, by definition, uh, are very bright and who often have a fair amount of ego resources to actually are able to go to universities. Uh, people kind of get stunned sometimes when you get out in the community and you find out you're working with clients who don't have very good verbal skills, uh, who perhaps don't have a lot of ego strength, who have no familiarity with uh, you know, how you go up about presenting yourself. Uh, they just know that they're, they're, they're in pain. Uh, and so you know, this theory is just getting exposed in some ways to more troubled clients and more complex problems, but, uh, but th there's real promise. Now, if we look, uh, by the way, uh, at the criticism I mentioned earlier, you know, that perhaps psychologists use this, use cognitive behavioral therapy because it lends to research, that, that it's really okay to be critical of psychology for that. Uh, we'll find out uh, as studies go on whether or not uh, this treatment really is as efficacious as some of its diehard proponents think. You'll see as we go through the studies I'm going to talk about, there's no question, it really does help some problems. And I would say that you know, there, there is really no treatment that we're, and we're going to talk about several others, but there is no treatment that is the universal treatment. I mean, that's the kind of the, the sad thing and, it, and it's the real challenge in clinical psychology and training people is you want to train people to really have a myriad of tools available to them uh, to use an intervention because no one thing works. And, but you, if you watch television, you know, these days especially, you can get the impression there are some drugs that will cure everything. Uh, and certainly the, the pharmaceutical companies would like you to believe that. You know, take this drug, you, know, you won't have any more anxiety, you won't have any more depression, uh, you'll overcome your obsessions, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and we are in a culture where that easy approach to things uh, you know, does get emphasized. Uh, if, you've, if you're television watchers, I mean, how often do you say things these days? The big thing is losing weight. And there are drugs, you know, and they, and they go into physiological explanations and tell you this drug will definitely cause you to lose weight. Uh, the truth is, probably some people will lose weight with that drug. It's probably very good for some people. But if you start thinking that that is the only way, uh, then you're going to find for a lot of people this will not work. Same is true. There are some drugs that surely are helpful with depression, and we'll talk about that. And there are some drugs that are helpful with other disorders. But if you're limited to thinking that drugs will solve uh, the kind of clinical problems that exist, that's a terrible limitation. It's also a terrible limitation if you only have one kind of therapy that you do. That is, if you, you're only willing to be a, take a client-centered approach, you're only willing to be a cognitive behavioral therapist, uh, you're only willing to do dynamic therapy. If, if you are that limited, then probably any number of people will come to you and they will be poorly served because you simply can't use only one approach. Now, we'll talk here today then a bit about cognitive behavioral therapy in some of the studies to see you know, when does it work? Now, uh, as I mentioned before, well, you know, one of its earliest uh, targets was to uh, treat depression. And, and it has been shown in numerous studies that cognitive behavioral therapy is more effective than no treatment. That, so, and, and that's very important. Uh, there's been lots of uh, kind of focus by people who think that if, uh, you know, in fact, you know, the wisdom of grandma, you know, just, just wait a while and it'll go away. Well, not true. Uh, it's been shown clearly that if you just leave somebody untreated, they will not do as well as if they enter into cognitive behavioral therapy. Also, uh, and this is important, in terms of the treatment of depression, cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be more effective than nonspecific treatments. So that this idea of targeting the symptom does have some real benefit. 
that, uh, that if somebody you know, says, this is my problem, and you really focus on that problem, uh, that people do better than if they started in a therapy that's not going to, to target that. Now, also behavior th or cognitive behavioral therapy has been shown to be at least as effective or more effective than other psychological and pharmacological uh, interventions. So uh, if we're talking about depression, <clears throat> at least certain, you'll see in a moment, it, it, it gets more complicated, but, but if you're talking about depression, this is not a bad approach to start with. Also important in the research that's been done is that it's been shown consistently that if cognitive behavioral therapy is effective, that it remains effective. That is, the relapse rate is low. So that uh, once the treatment stops, uh, if you follow people up later, you find out that it really did work. The person has overcome the problem. Uh, they don't go back to, to that state. Now, a, a much <clears throat> quoted uh, fairly recent study is that of the National Institutes of Mental Health Treatment of Depression Collaborative Research Program. Long title. Uh, but you'll see uh, in this uh, title that the, could we have that slide please? Uh, see if uh, they can bring that up. Could we have the, okay. This way uh, you'll see. Uh, now, this really was, it was a very well done study. And, uh, and it, it compared a number of things. It, it compared uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to interpersonal psychotherapy. And by the way, the, the, this interpersonal psychotherapy was a very specific kind of in intervention developed. Uh, it was developed for depression. It was developed by uh, Myrna Weissman uh, Gerald Clareman and some of their colleagues. And what it does is it, it focuses on the relationship between one's mood and life events. And the life events that it uh, is most targeted to are those that are interpersonal relationships. Now there was another treatment, uh, a, a tricyclic antidepressant called amipramine uh, was used. And then there was a placebo medication. Everybody know what a placebo is? What is a placebo? Mr. Jones? It's a drug used by the, like has no effects at all, but it's sold to the patient that it does have effects, so we can see if they're drawn to it. Very good. Yes, it, it is, uh, in many ways, it's a pill <clears throat> rather than a drug. It is a pill in which the person is led to think that it has some kinds of chemical uh, benefit, but in reality, there really is no agent in this pill that should have any effect on a person. So the, the reason for placebos, and they come up in these studies, is you, you want to see anytime you're using a drug, for example, how much is really the effect of the drug versus how much is the effect of your own psychological anticipation that you're gonna be helped. Uh, so that's very key. Now, what we found in this, this study, uh, this very large study, and, uh, and, and your, your textbook, by the way, you know, gives you a fairly good description of this. All three treatments performed equally well. That is the cognitive behavior therapy, the interpersonal psychotherapy, and the amipramine all performed well. And, and they only studied, uh, though, uh, the about 50% of the participants who completed a 16-week course of treatment. And if they did, that is those who stayed in the study for 16 weeks, they all got better to some degree. Now, CBT was slightly more effective than the other treatments with people who had less severe forms of depression. However, it, it did less well with people who had more serious forms of depression. And, and importantly, all three of these treatments did not differ 
and relapse rates after 18 months. Uh, they did find that in the amipramine group, uh, by the way, I should probably, um, Uh, later on, there is. Uh, the, after 18 months, there's not. But uh, the, later, it's found that, the, uh, that those people who were on amipramine relapsed more than those people who got the interpersonal psychotherapy or the cognitive behavioral therapy. There's almost a logic you know, to, to this when you think about it, because if you're going to intervene with medication uh, and you give the medication for a certain period of time, and, and, and the important thing is that some antidepressants you know, are very powerful. I mean, there are a lot of side effects. So uh, if you can avoid it, you don't want people to take the drug longer than they have to. The problem is that when that's the sole treatment, if you stop giving the drug, uh, sometimes people then relapse. Uh, and, but if you continue the drug, and we'll talk about this at a later time, but there, there, are, there are other side effects that are also quite negative. So it, it's a dilemma for those people who are prescribing to try to figure out how to use the drug. Now, we get a little more complex in, in a more recent study. Steve Holland and his colleagues compared the efficacy of 12 weeks of uh, cognitive behavioral therapy alone, imipramine alone, and a combination of CBT and imipramine. And then there was a, a, a cohort, a, a group, that got 12 weeks of imipramine followed by another year of active drug treatment. So you have all these conditions that are going on for 12 weeks, but you have one group and they just got imipramine for 12 weeks, but you got another group that, that had imipramine and it continued on uh, for another year. Now after 12 weeks, the groups did not differ. So you, you couldn't distinguish uh, any group from another group. At a two-year follow-up, the participants who had taken only 12 weeks of imipramine fared worse than all other groups. So, you know, one of the conclusions you obviously reach is 12 weeks of imipramine is not enough uh, for someone. This study also, you know, demonstrated that, that CBT worked well. And interestingly enough, and, and kind of surprising, there was no benefit to getting uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and imipramine. So you might have thought, well, you know, if cognitive behavioral therapy is, is doing a fairly good job, and amipramine is doing a fairly good job, but they may be doing something somewhat different, <clears throat> then if you would give the patient both of those, you would have the best chance of the person improving. Uh, I mean, that's very logical, but it turned out not to be true. It turned out that you just had to use one of them and you would get an effect. But the, the difference was that with the cognitive behavioral therapy, this lasted much longer. That is, people learned something about themselves and they applied certain ways of dealing with their life that allowed them to not be depressed uh, a year and two years later, whereas the people who perhaps had a more passive treatment, that is they were just taking the drug, when they stopped taking the drug, uh, they hadn't developed the coping skills apparently that would uh, allow them to, to, to do better. Now also, and this, is, this study then contrasts with the NIMH study that we just talked about. And here, more severely depressed participants responded well uh, to cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, as did the less uh, depressed patients. It was an important step forward because in the beginning of the first study, we began wondering, maybe we can deal with modest levels of depression if we intervene, intervene with cognitive behavioral therapy. But you know, if you're talking about real serious depression, this intervention is not the one. This study actually showed that with, some, with more severe forms of depression, uh, cognitive behavior therapy really was very effective. There, 
There still is a need, uh, I think, you know, to, to study profound levels of depression. There are some levels of depression that I think almost uh, surely you need to intervene uh, with some kind of antidepressant. Uh, and the kind of the way in which you determine that, uh, the, the, in the diagnosis is if somebody is, is really very depressed and they seem to have episodes of this and there doesn't seem to be any external reason for those, that is nothing is happening in their life that would seemingly cause them to be depressed uh, at this time rather than at another time. And if in examining them you don't find in their internal life they're, they're saying things to themselves or being hostile to themselves in some way, uh, but they go into a, a very deep level of depression, that level of depression it seems uh, really is helped a lot by antidepressant drugs. On the other hand, if you have someone where it is, there are really good existential reasons for why this person is so depressed. Uh, some terrible event happened in their life. Uh, they just broke up uh, an important relationship. They were fired from a job they really liked and they, uh, and they never an anticipated that would happen. Uh, and uh, though they experienced some other kind of loss and they go into a, a very you know, intense depression, it's fairly obvious that uh, this is not a biochemically caused depression that, you know, this is a depression that has real existential stimuli that brought it on and therefore something like cognitive behavioral therapy is probably going to be a much more effective intervention than simply giving somebody uh, medication. Now, the use of uh, CBT uh, has been uh, as the sole treatment for unipolar depression, that means that someone has a serious disorder, but the effect is they, they only get depressed. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy has been effective, uh, and it's also been seen as an adjunct uh, to pharmacotherapy uh, when you're talking about treating bipolar disorders. Now, unipolar disorder uh, in depression refers to the fact that the person has a very serious disorder and when they're not functioning well, their symptoms always move towards depression. When we talk about someone having a bipolar disorder, we're saying that when the person gets troubled, they, go, they can go in possibly one of two directions. They can either get very depressed or they can get very manic. That is, they either become almost dysfunctional, uh, being depressed, moping, unable to go outside perhaps, unable to go to work, unable to take care of children, unable to be responsive to other people. I mean, a very serious level of dysfunction. Or they become a very manic -y. Uh, You know, clean the house twice a day, uh, you know, wash the car, uh, you know, race out to the store to buy all kinds of things, uh, spend money lavishly even on things that are not needed. Uh, you know, work very rapidly at work, talk in a very rapid kind of speech, etc. When, uh, when people have those kind of symptoms, it turns out that cognitive behavior therapy by itself is not really as effective as uh, drug intervention. And we, we actually learned this a long time ago. There's, there's a drug called lithium. And we found with, you know, people who were manic depressive, uh, it was amazing how lithium really help them to come to grips with these mood swings. And while we haven't yet come up with a good physiological uh, or biochemical uh, you know, understanding of what actually happens with people uh, that sends them into these, these kind of variant mood swings, what we have learned is that probably medication is the first intervention you, you want to use. Now, where uh, any number of therapies become helpful then is, you know, lithium is a very powerful drug. And you do have to take it for a while for it to be effective. And when you go off it, there is a danger that you will relapse. And so the reason you put people into therapy uh, when they're in the stage is you want to help them to monitor themselves so they will begin to recognize when they're beginning to head towards one of those mood swings again. Because you can teach people that. 
And once they learn that, then they need to go in and see the psychiatrist they were seeing before, who can then begin to prescribe medication for them again. Uh, in some states, they could go see it. Well, in two states, they could go see a psychologist now because psychologists prescribe medication in two states. But for the most part, it's still psychiatrists who do this. And it's important that, uh, that the person like, recognize that because you can head off an entire psychotic reaction by simply starting to take the medication when you experience the kinds of thoughts that you know are going to lead you to either get very manic or they're going to lead you to get very depressed. So even in, in this uh, kind of level, uh, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy has a role, although in this particular disorder, it's much less significant. Now, I'm going to turn to anxiety disorders. And uh, CBT has been used, uh, certainly for the treatment of anxiety disorders. Some people would, would really tell you it, it is the treatment of choice uh, for specific phobias which, of course, phobias generate a great deal of anxiety. Now, medication has not been shown to be effective in the treatment of specific phobias. And most other psychological interventions have not been shown uh, to be as effective uh, as CBT. Now, one uh, variant of this uh, is when CBT has used, been used like in the treatment of panic disorders. And there's a psychologist, David Clark, and he has a group of, of colleagues who compared the efficacy of CBT, applied relaxation, and amipramine. So there were three possibilities here for treating panic disorders. Either you're going to get cognitive behavioral therapy, you're going to get relaxation, or you're going to get an antidepressant. And then they placed clients, and this is typically done, on a waiting list, and they served as a control group. That is, so they had these four groups. Uh, one group was a group that they simply told they, uh, they will treat them, but they can't treat them now. They will have to, to wait for a while. Now, at the end of this uh, study, clients in all three treatment groups were doing better than the clients who were on the wait list, that is, on the control group. So, Apparently, something happened in each of these therapies because each group was doing better than those who did not get some form of treatment. And the CBT clients fared better than those who received applied relaxation or those who received amipramine. And in a 15-month follow-up, the CBT group was still doing better than the other two treatment groups. And a notable uh, finding, actually, in this particular study was that between 6 and 15 months following treatment, so about a half a year to 15 months, 40% of the amipramine group relapsed, and only 5% of the cognitive behavioral therapy group relapsed. Now, that, that is a, you know, a staggering finding, and, and as you can see, it's terribly important <clears throat> to follow up in studies because you can see that, you know, for some people, uh, it, it, or it, in some therapies, it would appear one therapy is as good as another. That is, if you get interpersonal therapy or you get cognitive therapy or you get the medication, you'll get better. But actually studies are showing that you, you may improve symptomatically for a short while. But if you really want to get beyond this and, and get past this, it does make a difference what the intervention is. Well, now I think we'll uh, take a break here now, and then we'll continue uh, studying uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and then positive psychology.